my story starts with this person encircled with a third circle around him. This man is my father. He was born in Warsaw, and what changed his life is September 1939, the Nazis invaded Poland. He and his brothers decided to cross the border to Russia and start their survival journey. His parents and his older sisters, believing in the great culture of German culture, stayed behind and thought they will be spared. A few months later, they were evaporated through the chimneys of Auschwitz. However, he and his brother survived the war. They were sent to the labor camp in Russia with all the rapists, the murderers, the intellectuals that oppose communism. In a twist of history, he was released from these camps and as opposed to his brothers who decided to stay there, he thought that becoming a soldier is probably the best bet to survive the war. So he joined the British Army and they sent him to fight Hormel in North Africa. At the end of the war, he ended up in Rome. And when I was old enough to realize what he was going through, I asked him, did you feel victorious at this point? And he said, no. My victory is you. And as your father, I owe you three things and three things only, trying to teach me a lesson about what I need and what I want. So he said, I owe you food so you will never be hungry. I owe you education so you can educate yourself, unlike me. And I owe you music lessons so that would be food for your soul. There was one thing that was missing in this list, and that th thing was very dear to me, toys. <laughs> I never had the privilege to go to a toy store and said, this is what I want. All my toys were beaten up secondhand, but they served me very well. When I was young enough, I thought I can fix them, but I was naive, I couldn't, so I started to take them apart and I've learned about springs, screws, washers, and that was my introduction to engineering. Later on in life, I was having my exit uh, interview with my advisor, and he said, well, if you'll ever select or choose to be a professor, you don't have to save humanity. You have to help only one person at a time. And I created a sandbox and started building toys, t toys that can help people. And I would like to introduce you to Fred Schwedner. Fred was an executive. Fred, you're welcome to come. So Fred was an executive. You can take the spot. Fred was an executive in Silicon Valley, and he had a stroke. And he said, well, I'm worried a little bit because I'm walking slow. And I said, that's OK. That's part of your disability, and people need to understand it. So what I would like to demonstrate with, with uh, Fred to you is what stroke is all about. Um, his stroke was affected. Uh, he had a stroke on the left-hand side of his body that affected his right-hand side of the body. Left-hand side of the brain, right-hand side of the body. And what happened is it, it likely affected a, a very unique place in the brain called the motor cortex. He was afraid that um, his ability or cognitive ability would be affected as well, but he, so he started to read Shakespeare again, and he realized that he, uh, that was not affected. So you, you can start moving your left arm, and so you see this is a complete normal range of motion. Uh, his, half of the his left hand side of the body is completely normal, and try to do the same thing with your right hand side. This is what stroke is all about. So he managed to walk, but he uh, never fully recovered uh, motor capabilities of the arm and the hand. 
Another thing you can uh, notice is that his hand is like a fist. This is when um, impulses are taking um, control over the body. So the brain is guarding us from, from these reflexes, okay, which are primitive actions. And the, when the brain is died, the boss is dead. So these reflexes are coming back to life and, and they pull the body into embryotic state. So that you see people that are flexed like that. So part of the therapy is expanding them back and providing them a, a range of motion. Another thing is plasticity, no plasticity, uh, spasticity. And spasticity is a phenomenon where both the flexor and extensor muscles are contracting at the same time. So it's making the, the joint very stiff. So it cannot flex or extend the joints. That's it. Thank you. So he told me, well, I have a problem, and I think you can help me, which I was flattered. So let's say, uh, when we try to uh, help people like that, we, we need to understand what are the foundations of motion, or how do we move. So I, I want to do two exercises with you that will probably change your perception on the way you move. One of the principles is called symmetry, and obviously our body is uh, symmetric. The type of symmetry we possess is mirror image. So if you put a mirror at the center line, uh, what will be reflected, what, what will be behind the mirror would be identical. But what I want you to do is uh, raise your fingers like that, your index fingers, and start moving them in a clockwise uh, way, okay? Then increase this speed faster and faster and faster and faster. At one point, one arm will switch. And what you'll do is something like that, <laughs> right? And why is that? Well, the reason is that the brain cannot keep up with what you want to do. So it's drawing back into a fundamental way of motion and that fundamental of motion is symmetric. So the brain would always like us to do things like that and not non-symmetric. The second principle is redundancy. If you look at the body, you'll see that most of the internal organs or the vital organs, we have a pair in, in each, for each. Uh, but this is not just the end of redundancy. If you look at your hands, for example, you have five fingers. You don't really need five fingers. 65% of the object you can grasp with only two. 95% of the object you can grasp with three. But we have five. Five is one form of redundancy. Another um, idea behind it is that when you have an object and you, you want to grasp that object, the brain will need to know three numbers with respect to this object. X, Y, Z of that object uh, position and three angles orientation. If you will pick a robotic arm that will try to do these things, this robotic arm will need to have six axes. And you can tune these six axes to reach a single grasp. However, the, the human arm has seven. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So what does it mean that we have seven? It means that I can grasp this object and yet I can do this. I will not change the position and orientation of this object, but the arm can essentially have infinite solution or infinite position for that. So the question is, what is the ultimate position of the arm as I'm grasping it? So let's have another um, experiment. And so take your non-dominant hand and, and so sort of use your index finger and then grasp this index finger with your dominant hand, okay? Now remove the index finger without moving the dominant hand. Now don't change anything in the way you grasp, just flex your elbow. The, the hand have reached the mouth. 
among all the possible location that uh, it can reach, it reached the mouth. If I would put my elbow here, it will reach there. If I would put it there, it will, it will reach here. But the, but the brain particularly s selected out of the infinite possibilities to position the arm such that it will reach the mouth. Things like that are important when we try to introduce robotic devices to uh, recover function because we need to develop algorithms very similar to the way the brain would solve that problem. So what if our ability to move will be interrupted? The brain is, is in, in terms of body mass, is only 2% of our body, but it's a heavy consumer of oxygen. Every time you interrupt the flow of oxygen into the brain, uh, terrible things will happen. One of them is stroke. There are two ways to, uh, that this thing may happen. One is when you have a blood clot, and then the flow of blood from the main arteries to the brain uh, will block the flow of oxygen, and all the tissues related to that area will die. The other option is when one of the blood vessels will erupt, and blood will start accumulating between the brain and the skull, creating pressure on the brain, and again, that would lead to a death of tissue. This is how stroke uh, looks like in imaging modalities. Different imaging modalities will try to emphasize certain things, but uh, the bottom line is we end up with a dead part of the brain, and all the functions associated with this part will die or will disappear instantly. Every 45 seconds, one person in this country will experience what I've just described and in, end up in a case like Fred. 24 people during my entire talk will experience that. The economic implication of stroke is $43 billion with B, and this is accounted for medical care um, therapy and loss of productivity. You pay healthcare insurance all your life, but it, when it comes to uh, asking your uh, insurance company to help you, what they will do is they will devote 12 hours of treatment. It takes us 18 years, and if you're active 14, hour, 14 hours a day, that is 22,000 hours of activity to be proficient in moving, and yet the insurance companies will devote only 12. Why, do, why would they do that? They would do that because it's very expensive. It's very expensive to have a therapist treating you. And there is this uh, invasion of robotics into the field, and that invasion is trying to change the dynamics between a therapist-centered therapy that is just depending on how much time and effort the therapist can invest as opposed to a patient-focused therapy in which the robot is providing the primary care and the robot is, doesn't take uh, lunch breaks, coffee breaks, you don't have to pay um, insurance and benefits and it's just working. Neuroplasticity is the primary mechanism that uh, is the underlying recovery mechanism. And it accounts for many, many different things. In the context of stroke is the ability of the brain to reconnect itself and acquire new skills, in our case, motor skills. I want to show you uh, two video clips. One of them is demonstrating uh, symmetry. So uh, he is amplifying the idea by taking uh, one of the arms out, out of, the, of the robot. And what, what, this, uh, what this does is the left-hand side is connected to the right-hand side. And as a result, every motion that uh, a person wearing it would do will duplicate to the other side. In the context of stroke, you can put something, put, put a person in, and then this person with stroke can actually treat himself or herself. The second mode is a mode where most of our interaction with objects would require two arms, but they will not do identical things. 
we grasp an object and then we bring the other um, to interact with it. So this mode, what this mode is showing is that once you position the arm, the healthy side, then there is a force field that the, the robot will generate and sort of attract the other disabled arm to the same location. And that's what I'm planning to demonstrate for you right now. So I'll hook myself into the system. One of the things we developed to make the therapy more engaging, our virtual reality game. And so what you see on the screen are my arms. This is an avatar, a virtual reality avatar. And this is a relatively simple game. And what I will do is I will first reach with supposedly my healthy arm into, say, a ball. And then my disabled arm will be attracted by the robot to, to the target that I wish to reach. It's very important to introduce uh, games into therapy because games are engaging stroke patients intellectually and it makes the, the therapy much more entertaining. Okay, I think you got the idea. So I just want to conclude with one slide. And it's sort of showing you the totem pole of how we work and represent a collaboration and relationship between different fields. So the first is medicine. This is when we learn about the problem, and this is what, how we identify it. The second is science. Science is helping us to understand the mechanism involved in recovery. And the last thing is engineering, and engineering is providing solutions. And in the heart of every engineer, there is a small scientist trying to break out. And therefore, these devices are not just for therapy, but they can also help us uh, to understand the underlying mechanism of how the brain is actually working. Thank you very much. <laughs>